Hi everyone, and thank you for joining me for another episode of Hope Beyond the Headlines, focused on women's leadership. I am so pleased to have with me today my absolute favorite woman leader, which is Masimbi Kanyoro. Masimbi has had so much impact across so many different domains. She has been active in philanthropy. She'll be telling us about how she was inspired by her mother and the Isikoro movement and has helped transform philanthropy in the United States through Global Fund for Women, the Packard Foundation, uh, engagement with the, uh, the, Women's Fund, uh, the Women's Funding Network. Um, Musumbi's act, been very, very active in the international development space. She's on the board of CARE. She um, was the leader of the YWCA, as well as the Global Fund for Women. Um, she's been active on so many different boards and an advisor to the World Bank, the WHO, the UN, uh, women, um, just so many influential roles and has made such a difference in her career. So it's a real honor and a pleasure to be with Masimbi. Um, Masimbi, uh, I've said a little bit, but tell us a little bit more about yourself and what you're active in now. Thank you, Laurie, for inviting me to be with you. And you've already said so many things. But um, uh, let me say that uh, I completed my working paid job at the Global Fund for Women, which was for me more than a job, and I'll probably be talking about it. And now I'm doing just the things that I really like to do. A lot of them are things that give me opportunity to volunteer full time. Um, I am very crazy about education. I'd like to be able to say something about education because I sincerely believe that education opens the way for many people. And I just know that if I had not been exposed to education or if my parents hadn't been exposed to education, I wouldn't have had the opportunity to, be, to have such a global exposure that I have. And so when I um, uh, think about what it means to expose other young people and specifically to education that gives them uh, opportunity to connect globally. So right now I serve as the chair of the board of the United World Colleges. There are 18 colleges uh, from many parts of the world, and uh, you have opportunity to, to, to Google and see which, the, which they are. But they bring together um, boys and girls in their late teens, preparing them for uh, university education and um, being a mixed group, but also with the opportunity to be really selected with very high uh, uh, qualifications from their own countries. And from many countries, they've been in existence for over 50 years, and then brought to learn together at one place, and then sent into the world in some of the best universities, and many of them have become global leaders. And it very much reminds me of my own life, and that's why I am very devoted to that work. Uh, but in addition to that, I'm involved in environmental work, in climate change work. I mean, I'm very much involved with the um, the work of women scientists who are doing work on leadership and climate change. And I'm just really happily engaged in um, a number of other things that are local, which makes me very happy to be locally connected. Thank you, Musimbi. And I, I, I failed to tell the people who have joined us today. I'm in DC at the moment. Musimbi is in Kenya. Um, we met each other when we were both working in the United States, but it's great to connect with you now that you're in Kenya and with this incredible freedom to engage in so many different things. I want to uh, go to what you said about education and the impact it has on youth and your own leadership journey. Can you tell us a little bit about your own story? Uh, tell us what led you to this path um, of being such a strong woman leader and engaging in these issues? It's a simple story that uh, uh, we were exposed to education pretty early and encouraged to work hard. I think that's common to everybody. But I think what for me, um, uh, I can say that has been a trajectory that has followed me throughout the life was to take up leadership right from very early stage of being part of the United Nations Students Movement, uh, which during my time took up activities such as uh, being engaged in what was happening for us in Africa. It was about understanding uh, the impact of apartheid and being really engaged in the free Mandela uh, movements within that work, but also understanding that there was a world beyond us 
and people in the world who are organizing to actually bring changes, not only to their communities, but to stand in solidarity with others. And I think for me, that's where it started. And once it got started and got onto me that we can do something about the lives of people, it never left, and I still do it today. Today, um, in, the organ in the organizations that I have served, I've been able to connect with women who organize, women who lead, who march, who protest in justice, who join trade unions, who stand for political and religious offices, women who legislate, who dare protect exploitation of land, water, and air, and all of these and many others have really influenced me, mentored me, and inspired me, and kept me very, very, very much um, connected to, um, to the things that matter to me, and also have given me values by which I could live. And uh, it is to those many, many global uh, women in villages and in cities, in slums and in, um, um, in parliaments, in very well, uh, um, um, in very well lit streets of New York when we march on something or Beijing, et cetera. Those, those women have really impacted and joined the line of my own mother that began to give us that insight. And I see them as a great chain of sisters and mothers and grandmothers that have really opened the way for me and um, 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 will be there for me for the rest of my life. Wow, that's so powerful, Ms. Mbien. and um, resonates so much with me. We share two things in that. One is um, it really being the anti-apartheid movement, which mobilized me and you to a feeling of success. Once you've been part of a movement, a one member of millions of people mobilizing and a change happens, it's so powerful, it's so inspiring, it's so motivating, and if you can make a difference, it gives you such a sense of agency, it's, it's addictive. And so we, we continue to see that we can make the world a better place. And, and what you said about being inspired by the women that we've worked with, have the opportunity to work with. In the prior Hopi on the headlines, when I was talking to Hazami about, you know, so many people think that perhaps we do this out of some form of feeling like we need to help people from a sense of, um, being better than, but it's not that at all. But the, the, it is such an incredible gift and opportunity to work alongside change makers all around the world, like yourself, but at all levels of, of, of life. So that really, really resonates for me and for Women for Women, being able to be part of a change, being inspired by women leaders uh, at all levels. Um, but you mentioned um, um, Isikoro, and I, and I want you to talk a little, um, Isirika, sorry, <laughs> mutilize, it's not my language the Maragoli language, but I learned so much from your, your TED talk. And so I'd like you to share a little bit about um, what that means, why you did a TED talk on it, um, and, and how we can all take it for it. Um, when I did the TED talk, uh, Isirika, that now many people have had opportunity to see it, I wanted to, do, to be able to do three things. One was to be able to say, all over the world, even in rural areas, women understand the importance of organizing and organizing as movements and reaching out to each other and making great changes. I saw it from childhood from my own mother. She was part of an organization. She was inspired by um, what the community has. And what the community has is the respect for each other's humanity and the belief that to be human together means to affirm each other in the way that we are, to be able to ac accept the gift that each person brings to the table, and not to create hierarchies of gifts, hierarchies, whether it is in philanthropy, where we say the biggest giver is the most recognized, and the small giver is not the most recognized. This became very, very clear to me when I was the CEO of the Global Fund for Women, that we could see that we had a number of important great donors. Some had the capacity to give a lot of money to a million dollars or even more, and others had the capacity to give $10 and $20. And even $1, but within their currency, if you multiply that $1, it's a lot of money. So this generosity of heart, of the ability to affirm every gift of knowledge, every gift of, 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 of money, every gift of talent, 
is what Isirika is about. And I wanted to be able to, to say, this is for me what I feel inspires our common humanity to accept each other and affirm each other in that way. And I think we would learn quite a lot. The other thing was important to be able to see that when we organize and do things together and respect what we bring to, to the table, we gain more. And I learned this through movements that I have seen as I've worked with women for over three decades. Movements such as reproductive justice movements, justice for girls movements, LGBTQI movements, indigenous women's movements, movements of people with disabilities, young women's movements. And there are even movements of, of what I call like poor women's movements or rural farmers movements. This organizing and working together collectively and collaboratively Helps, helps us to achieve more, but also gives us more opportunities for sustainability. I wanted to be able to say sustainability doesn't come by people coming from far away and when COVID or something else come and they have to rush away and be close back into their own places, you are left alone. It really requires being able to affirm uh, local movements because I saw the local movements that were there during the time of my mom, and my mom is long dead, continue to be, uh, um, to be there. They continue to actually bring differences to people, and they continue to sustain people to help, to, to help and reach out to each other. As I speak to you today, a neighbor of ours lost her husband due to cancer, and the community came together, and they have raised enough money for her to be able to carry out her burial duties um, without um, uh, you know, being improvised, and they have done so because they have the spirit of the circle. And then the last thing that I wanted to show is that um, uh, philanthropy exists in many forms. And um, I saw it in my own community that people gave. Sometimes they gave in kind, sometimes they gave in their own labor, and sometimes they gave in money form. And we need to affirm all these means of philanthropies in order to make a big difference. And as someone who worked for many years in the area of philanthropy, sometimes being able to give opportunity for people to get grants and funds from abroad to do a lot of work, I want very much to affirm that. But I also want to affirm that there exist local philanthropies that we should continue to speak about so that when we give money to communities, we should understand that the money from abroad does make them probably do bigger things. But even if there wasn't that money, community would find a way to continue to do as much as they could with whatever that they have. And I wanted us to be able to affirm that the local philanthropy as well. I am, um, I think that's so, so important, Ms. Amy. And we, we see, there's two parts of that that we see so much at Women for Women that I wanna um, highlight. One is the generosity of our supporters who have given throughout COVID, uh, even when they're facing their own financial difficulties. Uh, we've gotten these most heart moving letters saying, you know, I can't give a lot right now because I'm facing this hardship, but I wanted to still give $5 or $10 or renew my sponsorship. Um, we once got a call from a gentleman who said, uh, my wife just died today, but I wanted you to know that I'm going to continue the sponsorship because it meant so much to her. So you have this incredible generosity from people who are giving small amounts of money, um, even though it's not easy for them because they're so called to, to serve and connect. Um, and then in the communities that we work and invest, um, we have these incredible examples of people passing on and sharing not only what they have, but what they're given. So in Nigeria, during COVID in the last couple of months, we were able to continue giving women cash and they literally redistributed the cash to other people in the community who weren't able to stay enrolled in the program. In Rwanda, I was at um, a graduation ceremony. 800 women had graduated from our year long program. And part of the ceremony was each of them passing on to others um, some gift. And so this is such a deep part of so many cultures. Um, and it is such an important part. Another, another story that comes to mind, which is also so important, is a Kurdish woman who said to me, as part of our Syria uh, response in northern Iraq, the most important thing that we've been able to do is help others. So when you are displaced or when you are um, impoverished, 
the ability to help another person gives you that feeling of power I was talking about before. So, so important what you're talking about in terms of recognizing philanthropy, not just as these big gifts that come, but as acts of support that people give each other um, and, and the equity and the power in that. But I also wanna come back to something else you said, which is the importance of locally led movements. One of the um, good impacts of this uprising around the anti-racist movement has been a deeper look or a broader look, more people looking at the structure of development aid and flows. And I'd like you to talk a little bit about that connection between all this grassroots activism that you've been part of and doing and supporting from, from childhood up to the advisory roles you've had with everybody from the World Bank to now the UN Global Compact Board and, and the, the very institutions that help with um, humanitarian and international aid and the human rights movement. Can you speak a little bit about um, how we need to transform the way we do this work in order to enable that local leadership that you're speaking about? So I think that um, we are at a, a good time in uh, um, the life of social movements, the lives of philanthropy and development, et cetera. We've done some things and tested them, but over the last uh, probably two or three or four decades, a lot of people have really seen the importance of um, um, building um, connections to local movements and uh, recognizing the capabilities that exist and the capacities that they have. And um, um, I think what we will learn after COVID is that COVID has shown us, one, is that indeed we can be completely immobilized in terms of movements. So the whole previous investment in having people travel long distances to go to the others, and you and I have been part of this roaming the whole world. Yes be the change makers in those places. I think um, this is definitely something that will need to be retaught um, and um, probably more investment put at um, um, letting the local groups grow harder. Because usually the talents exist, but the mentality that we, we have about um, uh, transporting people from place to place um, is one that is inherent in the systems in which we work. And I think that uh, COVID is gonna teach us to, to try to see whether we can reformat those systems and put much more investments. I, I try to think of um, the amount of money you and me and several others have used just traveling world over. Several, several others world over. And if this money was invested in those local groups, I think it would be quite a lot. Look at how we are able to meet but probably if we had the opportunity before COVID, we would have made it um, um, possible for you to come to Nairobi or for me to come to DC to do this interview. And now we realize that there's potential to use the knowledge that we have um, um, uh, gained through um, very good communication possibilities to do more. The other area where uh, I see that there's going to be extraordinary change is, to, is our ability, we understand it, but we ought to do more of really supporting the resilience and resistance that exists at local level. Because if we just take COVID as an example, we know that a number of people are impacted in very deep ways. Either they have lost their income or they have been a gender-based violence or other forms of violence that um, will incapacitate them, et cetera. But we know that you and I and many other people who have worked in situations that are precarious, whether those uh, situations involve uh, um, uh, hard things like war or people on the move or people resisting or wanting to have more say in their lives, et cetera. People who are at a, a place where they are impacted by um, an issue develop a kind of resistance to that issue so that they can have the things righted, but they also re 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 develop resilience I think we should be able to see these words now bring much more meaningful mean, meaning to us um, uh, after COVID. Uh, the resilience to me has a special meaning because it communicates that defiance not to succumb in the face of adversity of any type. 
And I feel like a, a pandemic is an adversity. I saw it in the times of HIV AIDS on our continent and in the world, which was another pandemic that we have gone through. We've seen it in terms of uh, big disasters. People say, this has happened to us, but we want to rebuild. We're seeing it in the movements um, um, against racism uh, in the US, even with the destructions, people are saying, we don't want to be caught there. We want to rebuild, to resist, to, to realize the humanity that we want and the justice that we want to be there for everybody. I think we need to be able to look for these kind of resilience and uh, support them um, uh, so that uh, um, they, 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 uh, we, we are people that work against um, extreme marginalization that um, uh, has, uh, is caused by so many barriers that come on our way. And then the last one, which I wanted to talk about, which is so that it can go very much with your theme for these speeches is a theme of resistance and resilience, which move towards why do people do it? People do it the, because they, they have hope that they can be change makers or that some change will come out of their resilience and um, out of their resistance. This, some of us have called it the stubborn hope, the stubborn hope of uh, uh, refusing to give up. Um, in uh, um, other times, I have written myself about uh, many times about it's almost like a spirituality of not giving up. Um, and so you organize, you, you say we want to see the hope. Um, and this hope is the hope um, that believes that another world is possible. If you remember the resistance that has been able to, be, to organize people in the social movements, um, under this hope of another world is possible, not just the world that we have been given. I think part of the kind of change that we want to, to be able to support is the change that says we can create another world even after COVID and all of the, the things that we are going through. And this hope for me is hope that is radical. And when hope is radical, it's hope that says you have, if you want to work for justice, you have to be just. And you have to be just in such a way that you look at justice as not just us, but justice includes everybody. At the Global Fund for Women, we, we used to say, we want to have justice for everybody. And when we say everyone, we mean no one is left out. No one is left out. And the last thing that I want to say about this tab on hope, this resistance is that it's, um, it's resistance that is, um, yes, that we have to nurture and welcome. Otherwise, we, are, we would be very easily sed be seduced into hopelessness because our world has enough that invites us to be hopeless and to give up um, and to give up. But it is a resistance that tells us you cannot give up. And join people like um, Bishop Tutu, who says he's a prisoner of hope for the rest of his life. And I think that this is the kind of resistance that I see that will make a, a difference when we can be able to support um, movements uh, that are um, resisting injustice everywhere in the world and see the mass movements that will bring the change that we aspire, that, that supports the values that we believe in. Wow. Wow, Ms. Mbi, I, I love it. Stubborn, radical, resilient hope. I think that's something that's a really important thing for all of us to hold on to now as we're heading into, what are we, who, who even knows, the seventh month of this pandemic. So stubborn, radical, resilient hope. We radical in that we don't accept that we're going to come out of this with the world the same way it was. We're going to learn those lessons that you're talking about. We don't need to fly around the world. We don't need to do the same kind of oversight as we did before. We don't have, we can find new ways of being. Um, and so we're going to come out of this with a new normal that is a better normal. And um, stubborn, we won't give up. We are going to continue. As you and I spoke at the very beginning of this, we are inspired by the movements like the anti-apartheid movement, the disability movement, the women's movement, the indigenous people's movement that have secured gains 
through their absolute insistence of not giving up and continuing against the most incredible odds. And so as we face those moments where you just want to curl up on a couch and give up, we know that the future is in hoping. Give yourself that break. Give yourself that break. That's an important part of it. But then get up again and go. Be inspired by all of the women we've met in the movements. You know, in another, in a previous Hopi on the headlines, our Rwandan program manager said, we've been through the valley of shadows of the genocide. We can make it through this. And I think part of how Rwanda has been able to handle this is exactly when you have faced the absolute worst, you come out and, and at least you're, the horror is there and the pain is there, but you know you can make it. And part of, I mean, I think the other really important part of resilience is each other. Women for Women believes that resiliency is, is a great deal by having the support of others. And you were speaking about that um, as well in terms of um, not just movements, but in that concept of philanthropy. So the resilience of connection, um, and whether it's like this, every time I speak to you, Musimbi, I come out with more hope, uh, more inspiration. And so even at Zoom, even at distance. So um, I, I do want to uh, come back on, a, on another question, and it's very much linked, and, and ask you to get a, maybe a little bit personal about women's leadership. We've spoken about all kinds of leadership and movements, but we haven't honed in on your experience specifically as a, as a woman leader and what barriers or opportunities you might've had or, um, or about the role of women's leadership specifically in these movements that we've been speaking of and that you're so actively part of climate change um, and all the other movements. Can you, can you Talk to us a little bit about your own experience as a woman leader, any advice you have to other women who want to bring about change um, and what you think, why is women's leadership such an important part of what we're speaking about? In the early days of my youth, I used to emphasize a lot about the differences that we bring to the leadership as women. But today, as a, um, a, 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 shall I say, <laughs> as, I, as I interact a lot more with many uh, leaders, women, men, young women, young men, et cetera, et cetera, I think that for me, the most important thing about leadership and why I'm really um, uh, very much sold to the fact that women ought to be at the table is because they were not at the table. And I think that uh, we miss 50% um, of our population out and you can't be able to bring change that is going to face everybody, uh, that is going to benefit everybody when you don't have all of the people contributing at the table. And today, um, when I talk about an inclusive leadership, I want to be able not to talk only about women's leadership because when we only speak about women's leadership and we get into international forums, it sometimes says that a certain group of women leaders and not the others, a certain race of women leaders and not the others. So I want to be able to say, when you live in a particular context, that context, our biggest context first is a world context. So at that level, we do need to have um, a recognition that when women are part of the leadership, when women lead together with men, um, we get better results. And we get better results because we are embracing the wisdom that comes from all plus all of the other skills that we attain along the way. And we are also bringing our natural self to the leadership. And a natural self to the leadership um, has many gifts out of it. Even just between me and you, Lori, if we bring to our leadership, I bring my Africanness as well, and you bring your Americanness as well, it already gives us some diversity. So how much more when you bring all different kinds of women to the table that have not been allowed to be at those tables? You even get more diversity and more variety and more possibilities for that leadership. But for women to be in those leadership, it does not just be, begin by um, women being at the leadership in very uh, um, specific areas. It means everywhere. We have to begin it at our local places. I see um, um, 
when you look at a, a school board, when you look at the, the, the district or the whatever you call it in your own particular area, the leadership in that area, if it doesn't look inclusive, it's not going to be inclusive at a very high level. So I think that since the recognition of gender, and this is what uh, the UN Women is uh, um, encouraging us to be able to embrace right from long time ago, including what we committed to do in Beijing uh, 25 years ago, what we have committed to do in the sustainable development go goals, through goal number five and the other goals, et cetera, is this recognition of the other, the, the, the recognition that women bring to the table, also our own individuality, our own specificity, and our own skills that we have learned. I'm working with, the, I, I told you that um, since last year, I've been working with the, uh, the, uh, an organization which uh, brings together um, women scientists from many fields. Um, and uh, they are engineers, they are medical people, they are um, people from, inter from, from, from um, um, uh, communication engineering and others, et cetera, water engineering, et cetera. And uh, we had, what unites us together is that we want to address the issue of women in leadership. So what does it look like when you have a, a group of, uh, of uh, uh, techs, tech engineers together, and women are part of that? What do women bring to that space? And uh, when I listen to 100 women scientists, staying with them for, uh, um, for, for more than six, six weeks, um, and learning together with them, I realize that what we bring, it doesn't matter which field you come on, can be unique and it can bring a lot of change uh, to the table. Uh, and so I'm um, just really, um, you couldn't say it, whether we're talking about climate change, we need to have men and women together, or women and men together, boys and girls together. And I think that this is what gender is about. So what Musumbi didn't include in that story is where she was with all of these women scientists, uh, which is, uh, is it Antarctica? <laughs> and she has a fantastic article about that. And I, I want to make sure that uh, we make it available to anyone who's interested because um, it's another, you know, we've heard Musumbi how um, wise and articulate and clear she is. And, um, and that's another opportunity to learn, hear more from Musumbi. Um, Musumbi, I could talk to you for days. I've had that opportunity before, but unfortunately we, we have to close now. So I, I, I do want to thank you. And I want to thank you for that final message as well. What I hear from that is, um, and, and, and you know, Women for Women is focused on women because women are the most marginalized and we focus on the most marginalized women, women who have just faced the most discrimination and are in the deepest poverty. And, and when we go into a community, we ask the community to help us identify those who have left the furthest behind to help integrate them and link them to others. But what I hear you saying is that what we need is not just women in leadership, but we need an equitable sharing of power. Um, you've yeah. talked about it so eloquently, whether that's in philanthropy, whether that's in movements, that every single person has agency and power and a contribution to make. And we are a poorer world and we have poorer lives if we are not um, having all of that beauty of humanity um, at our, if we, if we keep people down, we lose all of that beautiful contribution um, that, that is possible. And so another world is possible if we have an equitable sharing of power. Um, any closing comment from you, Ms. Simbi, as we close this episode of Hope Beyond the Headlines? I want to close by really acknowledging that uh, I'm a product of uh, having been mentored by many people, women and men, but mostly women, because I've been um, for the last four decades working a lot, a lot, a lot with women. And I want to say that there have been women of um, um, every type and of, of every age, young women and the older women. And the way I have understood their mentoring of me is that they have shown me through the work that they are doing or the engagement that they are part of, um, uh, that um, change can come and that uh, it's possible to really bring a large uh, changes in communities by being persistent and committed and um, being able to see the other 
person and being able to be invested in the good that might come even when we are not uh, uh, the ones that would be beneficiaries of, 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 of that good. And um, it has convinced me over and again that um, um, being able to volunteer for leadership when you have an opportunity is something that every woman should embrace and never feel that there is a, a particular blessed or endowed women to be in leadership. And then once we are in leadership and we have a kind of leadership that leads into organizations and other places to know when we can be able to bring others in and never to get that, um, um, that uh, ladder that helped us to climb up um, away. Always keep the ladder on so there'll be more. And then learn how to come down the ladder as others also close. Because I think it's really important when we are in the leadership that we don't stay into this leadership. We campaign for our presidents to finish in term. Um, we, we see elections happening every four years as it's just about to happen in the US, et cetera. And sometimes in our own movements um, that we lead, we don't let those kind of changes come in and enable younger women uh, to come in and take the leadership as frequently or as often as it can happen. So I think we do need, even when we are in leadership, to understand that uh, um, a good thing to mentor people and to be mentored by the other, but it's also a good thing to change opportunities and let many other people experience and bring their wisdom to the leadership. It's, I think that's really can make us have vibrant organizations and vibrant um, non-for-profit NGOs as well. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be part of this. Masimi, thank you for your, your continued leadership. And even as you mentor and support others, you have been such a good counselor to me in times of need. And, and um, that's been incredibly helpful. And so I, even as you speak about handing over to other generations, we're grateful that you continue to lead on so many forums um, with wisdom and grace. And thank you for taking this time. And thank you to all of you who have joined us for this Hope Beyond the Headlines episode. You can tune in to other episodes at Women for Women um, Instagram and our website. And please also look out for more information about Lissimbi and the um, work she's doing with women leaders. Thank you all. Thank you, Ms. Simbi, and uh, have a fantastic rest of the week. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.